morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you. Welcome to Seattle, those of you in the room. Welcome virtually to those of us joining us online. We are so happy you're here. I'm Terry DeVoe with IMLS. Is that right? And um, we just are so pleased that we continue to have this opportunity to bring everybody together from the States and have this ongoing training. It is an investment. Um, we continue to feel that it's worthwhile. And our current leadership also feels that it's worthwhile. And we hope that's the case for a long time to come. Um, but we don't take it for granted. And having you here is such a joy. This is a state-federal partnership program. Um, we really do think of it as a partnership. And we hope that throughout the conference, uh, we'll be listening to you as much as we hope you are listening and learning from us. I just have a few quick things that I'm going to say before we get a nice welcome from our host state. Um, so health and safety wise, the masks this year are optional. Um, you're welcome to wear them <laughs> as you see fit. And we've kept the health and safety dots. Um, I am wearing mine high in the eye line. If you want to put a little knot in yours in the back and, and do the same, you're welcome to. Um, they're not exactly adjustable, but you can sort of make it work. Um, so the green dots are, you know, I'm open for the hugs and the handshakes. The yellow is a little more like fist bumps and elbow bumps. <laughs> and red is, I'm really still just distancing, and that's okay. Uh, we do have restrooms in the facility. If you kind of walk out the doors and look to the left corner, there's a door that will get you into the hallway with the restrooms. So um, they're here. And because this is a hybrid conference, again, we learned a lot last year. And one thing everybody did really well, and we want to emphasize again, is using the microphone. It will help with the audio for those who are listening in from home. And it's going to help us have a really good recording that we can put on the website after the fact. So please, uh, when you do have a question or a call out, be sure you're using the microphone. We, um, we learned through some hybrid conference experience, it's good to have a little placeholder on the slides for that Zoom box. So if you're tuning in remotely, that little space which is consistent on all our slides is in the upper right hand corner. So you should be able to just set your Zoom speaker box there and you won't miss any content. We have Cindy and Laura um, over on the side who are kind of our auxiliary core for the <laughs> virtual contingent. And although we're going to get both of them up here to say remarks at different points in the conference, they are doing the lion's share of lifting for virtual. <laughs> so we applaud you. <laughs> uh, we also have interpreters here with us. Um, so hopefully that's not too distracting to anyone. But we have a variety of tables that you can choose to sit at if it is. And I always like to give a shout out to our tech team, which is giving us the sound and the vision, two of our senses that we need for this conference. Uh, we are recording, and we will do our best to get these slides shortly up on the website, but it just it may take some time. Well, the slides are there, I should say, but we're going to get the recorded videos of all of our content over the next two days. So. Um, one thing we haven't been able to do for a couple of years is have an official welcome from our host state. And I'm so pleased that this year it's working out. Um, Sarah Jones is with us from the Washington State Library. And in case you don't know, it's not in Seattle. So she had to drive here in a lot of traffic from Olympia. And we really appreciate her. Um, Sarah took the helm during the pandemic, a really dynamic time for all of the state libraries. And she is just a force of energy and good ideas. Um, she also has some background in state libraries um, in Nevada and has worked in public libraries as well. So please help me welcome her so that she can welcome us. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here, and um, I want to take credit for this weather, so I will. <laughs> uh, it's, it's such a, um, a wonderful thing when we get beautiful blue skies here in the Pacific Northwest, and my understanding is you may have them today and for several days. So, um, first of all, on behalf, I want to thank, you, or I want to welcome you all to the state of Washington. 
um, very specifically for, from me as the state librarian, but also um, my office is in the office of the Secretary of State, so I want to welcome you on behalf of Secretary of State Hobbs, who is a wonderful supporter of libraries. He was, um, he was, uh, the Governor Inslee gave him the post to, after our current Secretary of State moved to Washington, D.C. to fight election disinformation, so we were really proud of that. And then last November he won a re-election to just finish her term, so he will be running again in November of 24. So we are um, Secretary of State election season all the time, but uh, I just want to say a few words on behalf of Secretary Hobbs in his passion for libraries and library services. Uh, Secretary Hobbs is the first uh, person of color to hold the office of the Secretary of State in the state of Washington. He's Japanese American and he's a true believer in libraries. One of the things that he will, a story that he will often tell is he grew up in the Pacific Northwest and as a young person his, he was in a single parent um, home, single mother, and the library was his sanctuary. And one of the things he did in that sanctuary was play Dungeons and Dragons. And he had great support from the library there and the librarians and it was the place where he felt safe and able to to express himself. Um, he, as you would at, can imagine, experienced a great deal of racism, including um, someone painting, um, you know, so, uh, terrible words on their door and on their, on their front lawn. So he really understands why libraries are so important as sanctuaries, as places where we feel safe. And he continues to be a huge supporter of um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing tabletop gaming, which I'm learning a whole lot about <laughs> because one of the things he's tasked us to do, and we are going to use some, some of our um, LSTA allotment with, is to really support role-playing gaming and particularly Dungeons and Dragons. So you're in the home of Dungeons and Dragons. Wizards of the Coast is here in the state of Washington. Love it. And Dungeons and Dragons, for those of you that are players or no players, is will be celebrating its 50th anniversary um, in 2024. So this very week, we are going to um, the Washington Library Association Conference in Wenatchee which is the Apple capital of the world, if you didn't know that. And uh, we are going to have a session on why uh, role-playing gaming is really important for all kinds of social emotional reasons, collaboration, 21st century skills. And then in an after dark session, we're going to play um, a, we're going to play a game and have people watch people playing that game. And the whole idea is that we're gonna support um, gaming in libraries with some resources, particularly the games themselves, but also helping people with, um, you know, finding, you know, experts in their area to support that gaming. But there's a really important part of this in addition to it just being in libraries and in the safe space of libraries. Uh, we are also going to do this in our institutional libraries, which are correctional centers and two psychiatric hospitals. And very recently, we just opened a library in a, a female juvenile detention center. So we're also going to be deploying gaming in those aspects. And we're also going to be deploying it through the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library. So we have assistive ways to, to play those games too. So stay tuned. Um, I think we might be um, you know, one of the few states in the nation that are leading this at a statewide level, especially with the broad perspectives of inclusivity and accessibility. So I wanted, I think that that's an important part of knowing that how lucky I am to be in a state agency that is so supportive of our work as it is and, has, and as it can be. So the other thing I wanted to tell you is that uh, I heard this wonderful story, and since it's um, you know blue sky out there, I can tell it because I I hate to tell it when it's dreary and dark and cloudy because you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. But this is a story that came from the uh, Washington Poet Laureate. Her name is Rena Priest, and she tells a story about Mount Baker and Mount Rainier, which you often cannot see when it's gray outside. But the story, the, the legend is that the two mountains were once married. Mount Baker is the, um, the male gender in the story, and Mount Rainier is the female gender in the story. So they were married, uh, but they ended up not getting along, so they parted. 
So the, the, the legend is that Mount Rainier, which is very true for anyone who lives here or visits here often, you often can't see Rainier. You can't often see Baker either. But Rainier is often, even in a blue sky, the clouds will kind of top the peak. And the story is that Rainier hides from Mount Baker. Um, purposefully, so he can't find her or see her. So I love that story, and as I say, those of us who live in the Pacific Northwest and here in the Puget Sound, you, you know, when you get the glimpse of, um, especially Rainier, it's just breathtaking. And you have the pleasure today, if you can get out to see all of our mountains, because we, I think we're often not, you know, not really thought of this huge mountain estate because we often can't see them. Um, I also know that you are going to have the opportunity to visit our Washington Talking Book and Braille Library today. I really hope you take advantage of that. It's a short walk. It will be a beautiful walk. There's lots of great places to eat that you can find something quick. But we're very proud of the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library. It was the uh, Network Library of the Year last year for the third time. So we're very excited about that. It is also um, innovative and does incredibly uh, exciting uh, um, programs. But in addition to that, it's in a very cool building. It's a building that used to be a Dodge dealership. So when you come, there's kind of a round um, front of it. And then it once had, it was in the 50s, and it had a turntable. So the brand new Dodge could be on a turntable, <laughs> and the people walking by could see it and admire it and desire it and come buy one. So we're really, um, there, there's a number of reasons for you to see that wonderful facility. And then as I mentioned briefly, so I was able to bring, hand out to you all the services that the State Library is providing here in the state of Washington. And just to give you an idea, but we do have the four components. We have the Library Development Group, which um, I think Claire is here. She's our representative from Washington. And the Library Development Group, as you know, does the work that you're all here to talk about. I'm really proud of them. They do excellent work. They've been incredibly committed to um, really doubling down, especially during the pandemic, to make sure that our libraries are served. And I think most importantly, as all of us, I came from the public library world just most recently, what we needed in the pandemic was flexibility. So oh, a huge thanks to IMLS for both the CARES and the ARPA funding, funding because that did give us that flexibility so we could meet libraries where they were. So for many of our libraries, you know, it's because we have very large libraries like the King County system, King County Library System in Seattle Public, and we have very small libraries in the most rural components of our state. So as you can imagine, the things that we supported were had that broad breadth. So for King County, we supported lockers, excuse me, so people could come get their resources. And in um, rural Stevens County, great deal of support for Wi-Fi hotspots, which were really, um, and still are unfortunately, some of the only ways people can get connected to the internet in that part of our state. So library development does a lot of exciting work. We also have pretty important um, state funding that supports our work too. We are in legislative session right now, and we just found out yesterday that our funding for uh, a program that uh, uh, supports Microsoft certification, LinkedIn learning, including lynda.com, uh, that has been funded by the governor's budget, the Senate, the House, and it's been recommended for ongoing. So we have been getting it one shot since 2013, but if we get it ongoing, then it will be permanently in our base budget. We are also getting significantly more resources for institutional libraries, which I mentioned is the, uh, the program where we support, uh, we have 12 facilities in uh, correctional centers, psychiatric hospitals, and recently a juvenile detention center, and we're hoping to add the other um, center that is for young men. So we're really proud of that. Um, if you are looking towards uh, making sure that, that library work is equitable, Providing libraries for incarcerated individuals, I think, is really incredibly important in that work. I think we're getting more and more aware. One of the things that I think is less aware than people would know is 95% of people who are incarcerated will return, will leave incarceration, and will come to society. And it's a very, very difficult path for those folks to come in and find jobs and find ways to 
uh, really thrive in this society. So one of the things that we have that's a really important partnership is the fact that our local libraries partner with us and we can get someone the local library card as they're being released from their incarceration so that hopefully they can find that same library services that they had um, in their uh, institution. So we're excited about that and also I can't not mention anywhere we are hiring. We have about 10 <laughs> positions <laughs> open um, in, the, uh, in the ILS system so if you know anyone that would like to have um, you know really an impactful career um, there, there are both librarian positions and paraprofessional positions and they're located all throughout the state and then so I think I've covered them library development institutional libraries the talking book and braille library and our wonderful library development group and I just want to end with a huge thank you for all the work that you do um, I as Terry's mentioned I've been in and about uh, this work either as a second time as a state librarian but always um, finding uh, both Library Services and Technology Act and I've been able to be a principal investigator for several Laura Bush grants and this money makes such a difference I think the part that I always feel so strongly about is it's not enough to do something completely but it's almost always enough to leverage the other resources the, the local resources the state resources the philanthropy to get really spectacular things done so thank you on on behalf of the washington state library and welcome to washington Thank you, Sarah, so much for those uh, rallying words. We're going to make good investments here this week. That's what we're doing. Um, what we are going to do, actually, is give everyone a chance to, who's in the room, get out of their seat. And we're going to do a quick icebreaker. We haven't done this format for a while. Uh, but what we have in mind is we'd like to create basically like a big conga line of y'all that <laughs> represents you know people that are new to the state library administrative agency maybe you've been there weeks months days and <laughs> on this end of the spectrum you've been there decades so um, everybody can line up in the room those of you who are online um, you're going to chat into the box you know your name your state um, how long you've been in the state library and your role and once we get people in the room lined up then we'll pass the mic and they can sort of do the same and then we'll hear from Cindy and Laura as sort of a wrap-up as to who's with us virtually so you got a few minutes to get yourselves organized here in the room and go I'm gonna all right Laura kick us off hi I'm Laura Hicks I'm the state data coordinator in Maryland and I am the backup to our state grants coordinator and I've been with the Maryland State Library for seven weeks oh my God. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jeff Regensberger with the State Library of Ohio. I'm a library consultant and LSTA coordinator, and I've been with the State Library of Ohio for seven months. Woohoo! Go, Jeff! I'm Talayla Florco, and I'm from Idaho. I've been in the position for 13 and a half months, and I'm the grants and contracts officer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Amanda Gammon. I'm the LSTA coordinator for California, and I've been there just over a year, 14 months. Hi, my name is Kate Inge, and I'm the Grants and Continuing Education Coordinator for the Alaska State Library, and I've been there for 15 months and doing my job for about three, three months. My name is Tara McLeod and I'm with the Oklahoma Department of Libraries and I am the Federal Programs Officer and Business Manager and I've been in that role for 18 months. My name is Tammy Lee and I'm the State Library Director for Minnesota. Um, I've been in my job for about a year and a half. Um, and I have a very sad sack story about uh, really desiring an LSDA coordinator and not being able to have one. Um, so I'm going to ask me about it, but bring a napkin. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley. I work for the Montana State Library as an accountant, and I've been there for, I think, two years in October. 
Good morning. I'm Amy Parker DeSorbo from the United States Virgin Islands. I'm the Territorial Director for Libraries, Archives, and Museums for the Virgin Islands, and it will be two years in June. Hi, I'm Bruce Smith. I'm the project coordinator for Wisconsin at the Department of Public Construction. I've been there three years, which means I started at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Christine Weiss. I'm from the Hawaii State Public Library System. I've been with the system for a little over three years, but I've been in the LST coordinator and special projects librarian for about a year. I'm Alice Smith and I'm the LSTA coordinator and also a state data coordinator for Kansas and um, I've been in my position a little over three years also putting me right at the beginning of the pandemic as well. Um, I'm Wendy Copeland and I'm the director of finance and grants at South Carolina State Library and because I started about five years ago it's pandemic years so it's like dog years and it's like a really long time. <laughs> I'm Jessica Otto. I've been at the Wyoming State Library for almost five years now, um, but next week I start as the research and statistics consultant and working with IMLS staff. I'm Natalie Dunaway. I am the grant programs coordinator with the Mississippi Library Commission. Um, I've been there now for a little over five years, but I started my job as grant programs coordinator right in 2020, March 2020 to be exact. So everything I know, all the wisdom I have has been learned remotely, actually. So. That's a lot. Hey, I'm Mary Ramey. I'm the Grants Coordinator for the Maryland State Library Agency, and I've been there for a little over five years. Good morning, I'm Rebecca Camp, and I am the State Data Coordinator for the Montana State Library. I see her every day. She said she's been there five years. <laughs> uh, I'm Angela Fox. I am the Federal Projects Coordinator for Indiana, uh, which means I do the annual report and LSTA. So I know there's some other annual report people here, so um, they could hear a lot more of me on those listservs. And I've been yelling at them for five and a half years. <laughs> I'm Carmen Redding from North Dakota. I started as the School and Youth Services, and I am now the Library Services Division Director. And it will be six years in July, and I'm retiring in August. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nicola Buffoni. I am the LSTA coordinator and library development uh, coordinator at the Rhode Island Office of Library and Information Services. It will be uh, six years in May that I have been with the State Library Agency. Hi, I'm Lindsay Forbes. I'm the Project Manager and Grant Specialist at the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Um, and I will also have been at the agency for six years in May. I didn't know she was good. Hi, I'm Catherine Prince with the State Library of North Carolina. I'm the Federal Programs Consultant and I've been at the State Library for seven and a half years. Suman Jones, LSTA coordinator for the state of Nevada, and I have been there for eight years. Hey y'all, it's Hadia Cleveland. I am from Pennsylvania. I have been the LSTA coordinator for nine years, but I'm a lifelong learner, so does that count? <laughs> Lynn Burris uh, with the state of Mississippi oh, yeah. Library Commission and nine, almost nine, nine years. Right on the side. I'm Sarah Black. I'm with the DC Public Library, and I've been there for nine years, almost done. Hello again, I'm Terry Blauvelt. I'm from Missouri, and I've been with the Secretary of State's office for 20 and a half years, but with the State Library, which is a part of the Secretary of State's office, for almost 10. I'm Maura Walsh. I'm with the New Jersey State Library. And before that, I was in uh, the Washington State Library, but I kind of have amnesia, and I'm not sure exactly how many years. <laughs> uh, I'm Claire Mamura, and I took over Mara's job at the Washington State Library six months ago, but I had been at the Alaska State Library before that for 11 years total. Okay. I'm Erica McCormick from the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. I've been there 
I should have known. I did know this. <laughs> Eleven years, but I've been the LSTA coordinator for three, and I am the manager of the grants and accreditation team. Good morning, everyone. I'm Evan Strubel. I'm the Associate State Librarian for the State Library of Ohio. I've been in that role for almost five years, but I've been at the State Library for 12. I, too, will also be hiring, so if you need, to, <laughs> if you need a job, I have a consultant position coming open soon. Come talk to me. Hi, I'm Kim Armentrout from the Library of Virginia. I am the State Aid Administrator, the SDC, and now the LSTA Coordinator. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brenda Hamilton with the South Dakota State Library. I am the Access and Development Services Manager. I've been there 14 years and I've been the LSTA coordinator for about two. I'm Michael Golick with the State Library of Louisiana. Um, I've been at the State Library there for 14 and a third years because I did the math. Because I'm this, as I said, I've been the State Data Coordinator. I've been the Associate State Librarian since November 15th. Um, so, and I too am hiring. I have a position open now. The application deadline is April 9th. Hello, I'm Jamie Ball, Grants Administrator for the Arizona State Library, and I've been there 15 plus years. I'm Susan Mark with the Wyoming State Library. I've been with the State Library 21 years. And I'm not sure how long I've been LSTA coordinator. I think it's seven-ish. And I used to be the SDC. Amy Heepner from the New York State Library. Um, I'm from the New York State Library. And I think I've been the LSTA coordinator for six or seven years. Before that, I was the SDC. and. Before 2012, I worked in the research library in reference. I'm Karen Reese from the Library of Michigan, and that does sound familiar. I started as one of the research librarians for the legislature in 1999. So I've been there for 24 years. 19, the LST coordinator, and I'm also the grants coordinator, and I'm also the school library consultant. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Cowan Henderson. I'm at the Tennessee State Library and Archives. I have been there for 25 and a half years. I've worked with LSTA for about 10 years, but been the coordinator for the past three. And I do a lot of things. <laughs> I'm Debbie Hall from the Arkansas State Library. I'm manager of grants, and I have been there for 37 years, 22 of which has been the LSTA coordinator. Hi, good morning. My name is Hector Reillo. Um, operation two years, operation manager um, service program, library service pro program um, in Puerto Rico Department of, of Education, and one month coordinator, and two, no, two year development. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right, everybody in the room can like make their way back to their seats. Thank you so much. What a demonstration of the vast institutional knowledge we have here. So be sure that you grab some before the end of the two days. And now we're going to um, beam over to our virtual set and hear from um, Cindy briefly, who's in the room. So we have, I didn't realize this mic was hot the whole time, though. So I don't know what I just said in the last 37 minutes, and we all heard all that. Um, so we have about 22 folks in the virtual room, and some of you have a real fan club. Come see you later, or I will find you. Um, we have a lot of folks in the two to five year range, which is um, not, to, not surprising. Um, we have uh, Lauren. Um, Ten months, or, uh, Amy in Florida, 22 years. Sam from Nebraska, 14 years. Jean in Colorado, 18 years. Um, Brenda in Iowa, one year. Um, New Mexico has a new coordinator who's been there nine months. Um, but Karen Egan, God bless her, 29 years. She wins the virtual raffle. That's it. So thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to wrap up this section 
with a little bit of IMLS overview. It's kind of like the flotsam and jetsam that we didn't fit into other sessions, so you're going to get it all here. But um, just by way of saying um, welcome again, um, you know, we welcome you aboard the Grants to States bus. And this bus is full of some wonderful, fun, kind, responsive federal folks, public servants um, that I have the pleasure of working with every day. And we are lucky enough to work with you in our work, and that makes our work worthwhile. Um, there's room on this bus for a friend or 50, so hop aboard. And uh, you know, the next two days will be a fun time of learning and collaboration. Um, we have some program updates and conference notes to share with you. So this is going to be kind of a flyby. Last year's conference theme was news when we were in Baltimore, and I, I think it's safe to say like this was the newsiest year we've ever had in the program. You were all finishing up your stimulus funds, you were doing five-year planning activities, and we've spent the last nine months trying to elevate all that work in our various communications channels. I won't belabor it here, but you can check it out. And, um, and I do want to say that we have two of our own communications colleagues with us this conference, Erica and Dan, and they're actually going to be doing short interviews with some of you. You know who you are, and that's going to be upstairs, and we hope to take little sound bites from those interviews and feature them on our social media. So this is the first time we're trying that, and we're pretty excited. We have, in other news, reached a very important milestone in our statute, which locks in a base of $1 million for states and $100,000 for territories. Um, it's due to the very large program bump that we got this year in our overall program budget. So um, congratulations to all of you for doing great work and reminding Congress that it's important, um, important work and worthy of getting more money. Not all news in Grants to States is positive and happy, so let me bring it down for a moment as I have a heart-to-heart -heart with you about extensions. So we've had a number of extensions the last few years owing to um, the stimulus funds and supply chain issues and all kinds of other things that were outside of your control. And we've tried to be very flexible and very accommodating, and we've given a lot of extensions. So at this point, we're kind of back, getting back to normal order. You're going to have your normal allotment every year. You're probably going to have two grants that you're administering at any given time. We think that scenario usually gives states enough flexibility to accommodate those strange things that are happening with their money. And so we'd really like to rein in all the extensions. So as 20, fiscal 2022 is coming to an end, and you're going to be reporting on it, you know, it will end in September, and you'll re be reporting on it thereafter. If you're sensing that you're having the same kind of issues coming up into fiscal 2022, just think creatively about could you use your fiscal 23 money and, and sort of work through some of that. It's not that we're not going to grant extensions. It's just that they're going to have a really high bar. And we always have to escalate those up to other offices in our agency. And so they're going to want to see the evidence that this was truly outside of your control. And um, if you can come to us before a period of performance ends, so that's usually September 30th, that helps us stay within our regulatory framework. So PSA for the good of the order. This is a visual of the SPR cliff, as I like to call it. Um, there are implications for extensions in the SPR, and this has been a driver for this program. This is a visual I've been carrying around in my head for the last two years, and I've finally put it down on paper. So there's a lot of words on this slide, but the ba basic gist is that in a normal reporting year, when you've got two grants, um, you sort of finish up your SPR, we sort of carry it to the finish line with program officer input, and then there's a little bit of a buffer zone where we allow the maintenance of effort um, sort of numbers to be locked in, and you've got a little buffer before you start the next year's report. But if you have a nine-month extension, there is no longer any buffer, and you're basically finishing both reports out at the same time which is very frightening when I think about those of you having to do this work and sort of toggling between the different years. And it's just rife with opportunities for things to go sideways. So we have to, by law, give you 120 days to finish your reporting. If 
you see fit to finish it earlier, I think it'll be good for all of us. <laughs> PSA number two. <laughs> the next three slides come from a colleague of ours who wasn't able to travel with us to Seattle. She's our director of um, grants policy and management, Connie Bodner. And she's been helping us sort of go through some of these changes at the government level that are affecting all of us this year. So I'm not going to belabor these three slides because they're here if you want to revisit them. But I've got kind of a sound bite for each one of them. With the unique entity identifier, which was the changeover that the SAM.gov system implemented last year for the first time, it's been a rocky first year. We all recognize that. The takeaway that we've been getting is that this should be a one-time pain point, theoretically, and that going forward, renewal should be much, much, much smoother. However, if you let your renewal lapse, you may be in danger of having to do a lot more paperwork again in the future. So our words to the wise are, do not let your registration lapse, like keep it active. And you may not be the person sitting here in this room that's responsible for that, but be in touch with your colleagues who are. Login.gov is a system of um, authentication for different government systems, and we have implemented it this year for our EGMS system, which is our Electronics Grants Management System. We haven't had a lot of feedback about how this is going from the states, so if you've experienced any pain points, we'd be interested in hearing from you about it. And there's some resources on this slide that can help if you have been in that position of having some issues. We want you to get paid when you get the grant money, and so our colleague has laid out a number of um, you know, pitfalls that we run into that prevent us from making your payments to you quickly. And again, we may have a few people in the room that are responsible for requesting drawdown payments from IMLS, but if this is not you, make sure that your fiscal counterparts get access to this information. Um, the one thing I want to highlight here is in sort of an internal review of how much people are asking to draw down funds. Uh, we've seen that some states and some entities ask for multiple amounts of money in any given month. And if it's possible to consolidate that to maybe two draws a month, that would make our work a lot easier. So we humbly beseech you to tighten that up if possible. Some of you know about limited English proficiency. Some of you may not and wonder what we're talking about here. This is a policy requirement of the program. It often comes up around the time that we make site visits because it's on our site visit checklist and we start asking you if you have a policy for it. This is just to say that we've heard from our legal counterparts at IMLS who have heard from our Department of Justice counterparts in the federal government that there are changes coming to this policy, which is government-wide, and that as soon as we get more information, we will roll it out to you. We're going to again partner with COSLA on the National Book Festival. Some of you in the room are the people that travel to Washington, D.C. for this, and some of you are not. Um, but we have heard that the date is going to be moved earlier this year. Library of Congress has not yet publicly announced this, so if you, need, if you are on a need-to-know basis, you can track down me or Dennis and we can tell you, but I'm not going to proclaim it publicly until they do. Um, we are thinking this year that we're going to give an additional about $1,000 per state, which will enable there to be perhaps local events that sort of hearken to the National Book Festival in your area. And these would take advantage of the great reads books that are picked by each state to be featured at the National Book Festival. And they would allow you to you know, tie them into the National Book Festival, acknowledge IMLS with funding, and sort of have that footprint of National Book Festivalness in your community. If you're hearing all this and saying, wow, that sounds like a lot of work, and we're not cut out for that, that's OK. We think you could also use those funds to offset more travel if you have to send more people or buffer unexpected travel costs. Or if you want to send more exhibit materials to Washington, D.C., maybe you want to print and ship some extra things. But we're going to give you this extra amount of money this year and see how it goes. We've got a great couple of days planned for you. Now we're getting into the conference proper. 
Um, just a couple things to highlight on this slide. Um, our director, Crosby Kemper, will speak to us tomorrow. He's actually in the building, you may see him, but um, he's off doing other, other excursions today and other visits with institutions. But think about questions you may want to ask him tomorrow. We've got 45 minutes with him, and it is probably the last year that he will be with us because he is coming to the end of his tenure with IMLS. So get him now. The optional lunch tour um, at the Talking Book and Braille Library that Sarah so graciously extended to us is something I'm going to walk over to. So if you'd like to join me on my walking excursion, I'll probably stand outside at the registration desk um, at the lunch hour, and then I'm going to go, because we need like 20 minutes to get over there, and I don't want to cut anyone's lunch short. But um, we're very excited about seeing this ex-car dealership facility <laughs> and all the exciting things it does today. All right, in terms of the logistics, uh, we do have kind of a yellow cover colored survey in your conference packet, should be the last sheet in your paper clipped packet. We take the feedback from this survey really seriously every year and we make iterative improvements to this conference. We also have the conference survey available by URL if you prefer to fill it out that way or for those of you who are tuning in virtually. We tried two things last year that were reviving, and they're over on this side of the dais. One is a peer-to-peer -peer appreciation wall. We are going to do formal recognition this afternoon, um, so some of you have already sourced those People's Choice Awards, and we will formally acknowledge them then. But if you just want to give a shout out to someone who's, you know, helped you find a great lunch eatery or just whatever. You can take the sticky notes at your table, write a little piece of appreciation and stick it on the appreciation wall and we will revisit those at the end of tomorrow. We also have a parking lot for sessions like this where I'm just trying to cram everything in and we don't have time for questions. So if you have questions that remain unanswered that you would like us to address tomorrow morning, stick them on the parking lot and we will sort of have a, a grab bag of questions that we can answer tomorrow morning. We have a dine around sheet on this side of the room. So if you're looking to have a dinner out with some of the fabulous people in this room but you don't know where to start, We've got several restaurants identified, thank you Dennis, who vetted these restaurants. Um, one in particular, Wild Ginger, I've heard is an excellent Thai restaurant. Um, so just sign yourself up in a slot and then after the conference is over, you may want to connect yourselves, figure out when you're dining, whether you need a reservation, et cetera. Um, if you're drowning in our acronyms, I'm sorry. We do have an online handout that we um, sort of summarized these up last week, and you're welcome to reference it throughout. And just hang in there with us. You spend, you know, as many years as Debbie, you're going to eventually get those acronyms. <laughs> We've taken some inspiration from this beautiful city that we're in, Seattle, which has a nickname of the Emerald City. So our conference theme this year is the Wizard of Oz, and you're going to see some references to that in our slides throughout. Bad puns, etc. Um, I never like to hold appreciation till the end when like half of our attendees have left. So I just want to say initially, um, we have a official meeting planner, Matt Burdetsky and Anna, who do so much. They get you here, they facilitate your travel, they get this beautiful room figured out and set up, they handle the beautiful recording with um, experts from our tech and audio team, and we just could not do these conferences without them. We've got, again, interpreters and tech staff who are our silent um, auxiliary core. We so appreciate you. Um, we co-host this conference with IMLS staff from the Office of Research and Evaluation, and we will be introducing our IMLS selves to you throughout the program. But to suffice it to say that Matt and Emily are true partners in this, and uh, we could not do this conference without their help. We, yeah. We have um, a new colleague we're going to introduce to you this afternoon as we think about support for the SPR. We've always got support from our Office of Chief Information Officer staff. 
Um, again, we've got Office of Communication staff here, and of course you, who have taken your time to be in this room, and my colleagues, the Grants to State staff, I mean, you guys make this conference the wonderful thing that it is, and we are so excited about the next two days. Um, those of you who have been with the program a few years have seen the star on the left a few times because we've been saying, you can do hard things, states, and last year we had a humble request from one of you to start doing easy things because you were tired of those hard things. So maybe the time is now, maybe this is the year, let's all shift into doing some easy things. So I would just say set your burdens down on the Grants to States bus the next few days. We're here for you. We get to lean on each other. And, uh, and let's go forward and do some easy things together. Thank you. All right. We took a few extra minutes from that session, but I know that Emily is a pro and will catch us right up for our break. Um, Emily Plowman is, um, as you've seen her last year in Baltimore, just a key, and she was a face last year on the screen because she did not make it physically, but she's here this year, which is so exciting. Um, Emily last year was part of our auxiliary staffing team and is now a full IMLS member, which is owing to not only the wonderful things that she does for us as an agency all the time, but I would say Matt Birnbaum's creative approaches to hiring. So we're thankful to both of them. Um, Emily is the Strategic Evaluation and Research Officer for IMLS. She has done deep dives with us on a number of our initiatives, including five-year plans. And since last year, we sort of departed Baltimore with those plans being due within days, we never really had a chance to talk about them. So we're going to spend a little time revisiting plans from last year. So please help me welcome Emily. Okay, so I am, Terry, going to catch us up. Uh, just to give the tech team a heads up, I'm going to go faster than you can click your heels together three times and say there's no place like home. Um, I also, you know, I, I would be remiss if as the data lady, you can just call me that from IMLS, um, didn't do some kind of informal assessment when we were doing introductions. Um, as you all were lined up here, I noticed that there tended to be more titles on that end of the room than on this end. So for those of you who are looking for career advancement, it doesn't seem like you get rid of what you do as you advance. <laughs> you just get more. Um, so, you know, uh, but everyone's hiring, so keep going. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to just start really briefly. I'm going to go through some of the major topics that we saw really pop up in the five-year plans. The next slide is a list of, is a bar chart that we would have showed. Oh my gosh, why am I telling the tech people to do this? I have the clicker myself. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Me. I need to pay attention. Um, so we saw this slide at the last conference where we looked at the different topical areas that showed up really commonly in the plans that you submitted. I went through and looked at a lot of the comments that the um, program officers pulled out as they were reading through each of your plans and just kind of looked at what it was in these most common topics that we were seeing in terms of where you're investing dollars. And I'm not going to read every single uh, note on each slide, but library workforce shows up the most. Not a huge surprise. That's a really easy thing to fund, get staff training, um, support student advancement, uh, help with um, elevating the competencies of libraries. But it was by far, it's almost a universal funding uh, mechanism that you all use with your grants to states money and, uh, and plan to use with your grants to states money. Reading shows up next, almost also nearly universal. Um, reading and early literacy have different, have very similar and a lot of overlapping concepts. But um, literacy tends to be really broader, of course, right? We're not talking about early childhood literacy. Summer reading, though, tends to fall in this category more than we see it fall into the early literacy. 
uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting um, reading through all of the comments for reading is that it could be broad. You know, we're going to reach the whole community for reading, all levels, and identification of specific activities. Or we have the example in Wyoming and other areas where they're supporting reading in places like prisons or harder to reach populations. We see broadband, of course, also show up. This doesn't count. Um, you know, this is another place where there's overlap. You'll see it in some of the other slides. Um, but there's this nearly universal commitment to accessibility with broadband. So uh, we do see investments, people planning to invest in things like equipment or infrastructure upgrades, training, etc. But it's this topic for almost all of you is really about getting access to your, po your entire state populations. There's not necessarily a particular focus on a type of population. This is a universal access concept. Um, for, early for early learning, this of course is, our, is a bread and butter issue for libraries. We have things like partnerships that show up here. Um, I really liked how like in the Washington example, they talk about sharing best practices for early learning. And when we had our uh, convening for reading last March in Washington, D.C., sharing best practices showed up as the number one, th one of the number one things that all librarians wanted in terms of being able to advance early learning concepts in libraries. So early learning um, broadly and sharing this best practices really hit, hits on that one. That one stood out to me. Uh, Georgia talked about targeting a very specific type of reading, so early learning can be broad. It can also be one example, one specific program. The non-library workforce tended to be one of the more broader topics where we saw more variety in what people were going to be planning to spend money on. Um, this could be job or digital skills training, making uh, job information accessible, a good overlap of the digital or broadband access concepts here too. Tennessee talks about partnering with the Treasury. Um, Arkansas talks about um, free access, trying to get free access statewide to those rural populations. So that's another good example of an overlap. We're using money for core concepts, um, both in one topic that you might be um, primarily focused on, and then in another like broadband, where that's just such a major issue for rural populations. We will take a 30 second commercial break so I can make a shameless plug for a MyMLS report that the Office of Research and Evaluation uh, supported funding through COSLA last year. Um, this, is, this was conducted by Mount Auburn Associates and one thing that I just really wanted to highlight here is that it, it's looking at the different types of workforce activities that public libraries offer and the original concept was what are the trends? What do we see? If we were to interview every single branch across the United States, what's kind of the common denominator of what libraries offer? And what we we ended up having to dial that back because trying to interview every single branch in the United States would have done several people under. Um, and it just was really, it ended up being really logistically challenging, so we did case studies instead. And not surprisingly, but also surprisingly, we found that libraries in this area in particular, while they have very strong, passionate, like, want to provide a workforce role, um, there's, there's really this, like, gap-filling element that libraries tend to recognize in themselves. We aren't the primary workforce drivers in our community unless there is not one, unless there is not a workforce element. We're the people who provide tech, where tech is not available in workforce training. Um, and uh, that there's so, so much variety in terms of how libraries step into these roles that there, I would guess, if we were to go out and look at all the branches across the United States and the structures within systems, it would be incredibly hard to come out with a consistent trend in the same way we might see what libraries do for early literacy or in the same way of what we might, might see libraries do for summer reading. So anyway, um, go online, visit the report. Thank you for the time. Now back to our normally scheduled programming. Um, uh, humanities was a super interesting topic that came up. 
This one also had a lot of variety in what people considered um, maybe some type of humanities concept. And I should say, some of this has some IMLS interpretation on it. You did not check a box anywhere in your report that said that this happened. So if you don't remember writing humanities and you know, you know something like that shows up, that was uh, our interpretation of what you were committing to. Um, I have to also give another shameless plug for America 250. Arizona is committing funds to help promote civic conversations for the America 250 effort, and that's something IMLS is also fairly involved in. Rural and hard to reach populations. Um, for those of you that have an area and a focus in here, we see a lot of things like bookmobiles, mail programs, expansion of digital materials. Uh, my home state, tiny, tiny town of Iowa. Um, the, the Iowa example really spoke to me. The Rural Shrink Smart program, uh, not about plastic wrap. Um, it is about helping small populations uh, plan for their population shrinking, which is really interesting in my mind because a lot of times is how do we keep our communities vital, but how do you actually anticipate kind of this outflow within your community? So I had to throw that in there. Okay, so that was very fast. Uh, thank you to the translator um, for keeping up with me. Uh, we're gonna do about a, a couple of speed round activities. So you've gotten up and gotten your blood flowing in the room. Um, we are gonna do a speed challenge and we're gonna keep, we're gonna do however many rounds we can get to before we have to go on break. And what's gonna happen here is that you're gonna get two minutes to go around your tables and identify programs in starting with non-library workforce and then rural and hard to reach populations, broadband and early literacy. So start, the first round is non-library workforce. And the challenge with this is brevity. So how many programs can you list at your tables in a two minute time period? So you need a counter and then you get 30 seconds to identify what you think might be the most unique program. And this is gonna be hard because I have intentionally not defined unique. I have intentionally not defined what fits in non-library workforce. Um, so you're just, it's gonna be a little wild. You're just gonna have to go with what you come up with. Uh, for those of you online, you're gonna be um, furiously typing in chat. And once we get through the, I'll, I'll call the two minutes, you get 30 seconds to pick the most unique example that came up at your table. And then we'll do a quick report out to see how many people were able to identify, how many programs you were able to identify and then an example of unique program. And this might, we might just have time for one. So let's start with non-library workforce. Your marks, cassette. And, and lucky you, we're about ready to head off to break. So once we get done with the report out, I won't make you do the other three categories. Um, if uh, I could get Dennis and Madison just to help out grab mics and go around each of the tables, uh, we're gonna start in that corner, uh, just so you have five more seconds to figure out who's gonna go and what you're gonna say. And we'll just go around, around the room and then we'll do online and then we get break. Back here. Hey guys. We had a, a little bit of a difference between states that do subgrants and states that don't. Um, but uh, what we came up with the most unique was um, technically she was mostly 2022 funding. Uh, but we have a community that is very wealthy. They're north of Chicago and close to Lake Michigan but surrounding them are a lot of fruit farms with migrant workers and they did a, a very intensive migrant uh, children's education program uh, they're wrapping up and they did great oh, that's awesome okay um texas has well we had a couple of uh, other items too but they said texas was the best one so i guess i'm the best one to talk about <laughs> um we were able to get a work a uh, library consultant position for workforce development only and we have used that with state funds and uh, federal funds we have uh, built a collaboration relationship with our texas workforce commission to train the trainer for libraries in um, 
locally and to train patrons of those libraries as well. Nice. And if, I mean, if you had time to count, as, a, as the data lady, I love to hear numbers. How many, like how many, did you get five, 10, 15? Well, we kind of struggled for a little bit. <laughs> Um, but I, I think we all had similar um, workforce development grants for um, uh, migrant populations and um, reaching those populations mobily. So um, in California, we had one specifically in Santa Cruz area, which um, did really well. And um, they had some technology devices they were able, able to provide for that community and help with job searching space successful. Cool. Oh, online. Well, that was fun. Let me tell you. <laughs> um, we had a lot of, um, thank you. Uh, we had some really interesting thoughts um, and projects, but we landed on um, re entry resources, mm -hmm. and that was out of Nebraska. I'm seeing a theme start to emerge here. Over here. Okay, um, we didn't get through very many examples before the time was up, so I think we counted maybe four, but okay. there's probably okay. more. Um, and then we decided the most unique was from Washington, yeah, where they have a program for FAFSA. Uh, but maybe you should explain. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a pilot program right now to increase FAFSA completion in the school districts with the lowest rate of completion currently, and it's uh, grants to libraries to partner with community-based organizations to increase that completion rate in their community. Very cool. Dennis, you want to go with this table? Uh, thank you. Um, at our table, we talked about a, um, a program in Ohio where a library was using grant funds uh, to pilot a program where they're using virtual reality headsets to do uh, skills training and trades training for uh, for people that are working with the company that could use the, the headsets to do traditional training but use a virtual reality model which we think could be could be something that could be big that's cool over here so we talked about, I think we had maybe like five or six just in general uh, we were talking about. Uh, one of the things that um, we talked about was um, the database that we have is like the job and career accelerator that we've put out there that uses um, state and federal funds. And then Natalie here, it happened to be this morning, <laughs> uh, she got an email from one of our sub-grants where they did a senior graduation for one of their computer programs. Oh, so she's got so the pretty cool. picture where they have all their graduation stuff. So Senior like over... Well, it's for 16. computers. It was computer learning. So yes, was it older? Yes, yeah, senior, senior, senior citizens. Senior oh, citizens, yes. Yeah. So it was the, she got the pictures actually today. So oh. it was interesting. Okay. Right, dude, let's go back to. Have they done it? No, they haven't. Okay. Okay, so we came up with about five databases, learning platforms, senior digital literacy hotspot lending, you know, all that good stuff. Uh, and our unique, which it isn't because Ohio's doing it, uh, project was um, VR for teens so that the teens can uh, practice with different tools and so forth and, um, you know, practice interviewing virtually. So that was our project. Cool. Thank you, Jamie. All right, we have over here. Hector? Hey. Um, hi. Oh, bueno, buenos días. Um, Puerto Rico, en el Departamento de Educación, tiene un proyecto de lectura desde que comenzó la pandemia, impactando alrededor de un 20% de los estudiantes de eh, bajo recursos, um, um, rezago académico. 
Uh, good morning, Puerto Rico Department of Education. Since the pandemic, we have a reading pro program that has impacted 20% of students, low income students. Oh, and mid low and middle income. Um, ya llevamos, um, impactamos eh, escuelas en Puerto Rico, 500, no, um, casi 500 escuelas en Puerto Rico. Eh, eh, y ya llevamos eh, dos años en el, en, el, en el proyecto de lectura. So we've had the, uh, reader, the reading program for our project for about two years. And it has had an impact on over 500 schools in Puerto Rico. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Gracias. Let's do. So we had maybe four ideas at our table, and um, North Carolina and Missouri actually have the same program going on. We are partnering with different people. Um, so working with um, Excel High School, which will, um, uh, once students go through the program, they will grant a high school equivalent diploma as opposed to a GED. Um, Missouri is partnering with their Department of Education. North Carolina, we're partnering with Department of Corrections to get justice involved in individuals as they come out of the system to help them get their degrees. Wonderful, thank you. We have two Hello. tables left. Hello, okay, I found the website. So um, Pennsylvania is, has a thing called Skill Up PA, and I'm gonna read it to you. It says, Skill Up PA is designed to help the Commonwealth build with a workforce ecosystem that supports positive economic development. Job seekers can explore career pathways, view local job postings, and register for free online learning and receive workforce services. So these, <laughs> so this is all in all Pennsylvania libraries as well as with other um, other air in Pennsylvania to try to build up the workforce. It is partnering with Career Link, Career Link and it is a state initiative. And we came up with six other things. Okay, wonderful, so thank you. That. And I think this is our last table. Did we miss anyone else? So I have to say in Maryland, we, we spend a lot of money on library development, not so much on worse, worse development. So what we do fund is primarily um, databases that are offered statewide, things that offer test prep for the SATs, tech certifications, uh, Peterson's Niche Academy. But I also wanna mention that uh, Baltimore City and the Enoch Pratt Free Library System in Baltimore City, they've been really um, pushing high school completion. And that's one of the big programs that has been most successful in Maryland. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, I appreciate your willingness to do a speed challenge this early in the morning. Uh, just as a reminder, deadlines always exist when you work with the federal government. These are your cycle deadlines for coming up with your awards and um, I know we'll go over them again many times um, between now and eternity. Um, we are going to take a 15 minute break. Thank you for your brevity. We will, that would put us back here right at 1030. Hello to those of you tuned back in. I'm going to give us a gentle recovery into the room and into the virtual room while I introduce our next speaker. Many of you are probably right in the thick of SPR reporting since we have so many extensions this year, which means that our program officers, our three program officers, Cindy and Dennis and Madison, are also in the thick of reading the SPR reports. Um, and you may or may not know that they meet regularly to compare notes and make sure that the feedback that they're sending back to you is consistent across all the portfolios. Um, and they take a lot of effort to get things right. 
and to read and to absorb all the things, all the exciting impacts that you're writing about in addition to the suggested tweaks. Um, so this, think of this session as a peek under the IMLS hood of that process. And it's gonna be led by one of the program officers, Madison Bowles, who's been with IMLS for eight years. And she's been a Grants to States program officer for five. She has, I think, remarkably put new energized effort into the reading of the SPRs every year. She really like reinvents her energy for this every year, which I think is a, a wonderful sign. Um, and, you know, it involves somewhat monotonous reading and sending back of messaging to you, but she really, she brings all of her heart and soul to this work among so many other things. So get ready for some helpful insights from Madison. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Great to see all of you. Bienvenidos. Uh, as Terry mentioned, uh, we are slowly as program officers looking over the SPR as projects come in. And, and while we typically provide me more mechanical insights um, at our SPR refresher trainings, this one is going to be a little broader in scope and a little more generalized. And overall, what we want to cover is that the SPR is more than just a compliance tool. Uh, and I know some of, some of that is the farthest from your mind uh, when you have a looming deadline, um, but we want you to use the SPR as a demonstration of how you spend your funds and the value that you bring to the Grants to States program. Uh, so we just have a little insight of what we're seeing so far. So overall today, uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit about optics um, uh, in terms of how your reports are, are viewed and received, uh, general reporting components, allowable costs, which is always an evergreen topic, and the state profile pages that Terry mentioned uh, previously. So optics, uh, when we say optics, we mean how you spend your funds will be scrutinized and interpreted in many different ways. Uh, we all have heard the different uh, news headlines, uh, and probably our own personal story is about how libraries are becoming part of the culture wars and budgets are being contentiously scrutinized all the time on Congress, in Congress. Uh, so how we spend federal funds is important. And since our SPR reporting is the record of how we do that, we wanna make sure that you convey your reports uh, in a really useful and a valuable way. Uh, I know this sort of feels like uh, Big Brother is watching you, or in the context of the Emerald City, the great and powerful Oz is watching you. Um, but you as LSTA coordinators are the ones who are great and powerful, and we know that you can convey the value of the great work that you're already doing. So uh, this is worth a reminder that your pro projects in the SPR are public-facing information. Uh, once they are submitted and reviewed and approved by the program officer, they are moved to the public SPR site. And you can see the link on the slide as well as a screenshot of what a project may look like. Um, we encourage you to take a look at your projects on this public-facing site. Uh, the only information that's not in the SPR public view it are the budget details and the upload additional materials. Everything else is public, um, but even the, that budget information and the additional materials are subject to Freedom of Information Act requests, so they are available to, to the public at any given time. Uh, now, allowable costs. Uh, we get more questions on allowable costs probably than anything, um, and they are seemingly the most obvious actions in how you spend your funds. Uh, when it comes to optics with allowable costs, uh, context matters. Many of us have already learned uh, that allowable costs rules are never one size fits all. Uh, so it's important to justify the costs in writing when you're formulating your projects and reviewing those subaward applications and make sure that you apply your reasoning consistently across all of your projects, whether it's match or federal funds. Now here we have a list of components that make up a solid cost justification. Now in this case, to get to the Emerald City, you have to follow the Yellow Brick Road. 
And to do that, you must have a solid cost justification. Uh, so the first are program statute and program regulations. Those are things like the LSTA program, the IMLS statute. Um, all of that information is on our website. Uh, we also have the grant agreement. So your award documentation, the grants of states manual, uh, the, the official, what we call an OAN or official uh, award notification is that piece of paper, PDF, if you will, uh, that you receive when we issue those awards. Uh, then we have the cost principles, which I'm sure you all have tried to look through many times. They're federal, uh, they're the same across the federal government when it comes to grant making, 2 CFR 200. Um, those set up a general baseline of, of how we are allowed to spend our funds, no matter who is spending the federal funds. Um, and then there are administrative and legal decisions around how funds are spent, what costs can be allowable, um, as well as any sort of guidance documents that we may provide at any given moment, including what we provide at this, at this lovely conference. Um, and then there are things like existing cases, precedent, and prior approval. Uh, has another state done a project similar to the one you're looking at? Um, have you talked to your program officer about the costs that may be involved and what their take is on whether or not it's allowable? Um, oftentimes we, uh, we get information and wisdom from our colleagues and other offices at IMLS, such as our grants management office and our general counsel uh, to make sure we are applying things consistently. So please always come talk to us if you have questions. Um, and then finally, the rationale. Uh, which really can can fall into any of these topics, which is how how does this specific cost um, or idea serve your program or project? Is it reasonable and necessary? I'm sure you've heard us say that ad nauseum, um, but it's worth considering those things uh, and whether or not it has a programmatic purpose when you're formulating how you're gonna spend your federal funds. Now, the more components you have here, the more solid your cost justification uh, is. And as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to be consistent across all of your funding uh, and keep the docu documentation thorough and consistent as well. Now, you may hear, uh, and, and Terry mentioned it earlier today, that we read each and every project that you submit in the SPR. And I'm looking at all of your, you states who submit 150 plus projects every year, um, especially during these ARPA times. Um, now, Cindy, who's recently crossed over from being a coordinator to being a program officer, can tell you that we do read every single project. Uh, <laughs> we read them thoroughly, and we look to see if the project accurately reflects all the wonderful work that we know you're doing throughout the year. Um, we want the language and the reporting data to be consistent, correct, and legal. Uh, the budget area is a place uh, where, where it's, it's a great opportunity to accurately reflect what you are spending on. Uh, for example, on the slide we have up, if a narrative indicates that two staff members participated in the project, but the budget reflects salary costs for 0.75 FTE, that could be interpreted as a discrepancy. If the activity details in the other uh, uh, example on the right, if the activity details it indicate 2,500 uh, print books, excuse me, 2,523 print books, 422 ebooks and 25 audiobooks were purchased, which adds up to 2,970 items, but you only indicated that 2,900 items were, were in the budget. Uh, that is a discrepancy. So please be sure uh, that the narrative and the budget are connected and tell the same story. We also would like you to be specific, um, especially with these ARPA projects, we feel you guys on, you don't even know how many masks you bought. Um, <laughs> but, but using, using, uh, not descriptive words like other or supplies is not helpful for us or anyone who reads the projects. Uh, but so please, uh, be sure to be consistent in terms of what you purchased. So locale data, um, the SPR gives you options for reporting activity locale data. 
And we want you to understand the implications of these choices that you make, uh, which are, as I mentioned, visible to the public and feed data visualizations on the IMLS website. Ideally speaking, IMLS would prefer to know the name and address of institutions that participated, benefited, attended, et cetera, your projects. And uh, this is the option on the left side of the screen. Uh, we also get requests from Congress to identify projects in a particular area or a congressional district. So this is this more detailed information is really helpful to us when we get those types of requests. Um, and we pull them right from the SPR. Now, for example, if an SLAA awarded 10 libraries and STA, LSTA funds uh, to support connectivity, you could report this higher level data, excuse me, higher level detail uh, by selecting the name of those 10 institutions in the locale section of the activity. Uh, now, assuming that these institutions are already listed uh, in the sub, sub recipient area of the SPR, and you can always go in and add new ones. Uh, and you don't have to type out the address information every single time. Now, alternatively, we understand that some projects, they may not be statewide, but they do uh, benefit hundreds of libraries in your area. Uh, you can include uh, uh, the, number, uh, the number next to the institution type. Um, this is illustrated on the right side of the screen, uh, but we want you to know that the higher level of detail in this area can reap the benefits down the line. So project outcomes and lessons learned. Uh, these project outcomes in each project, you have a question? We'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Hadia. Um, project outcomes are the open-ended fields near the end of each project, and they allow you to share lessons learned. Uh, program officers, as we've been reading projects recently, have seen a recent downward trend in filling out the project outcome section. Now, please know that these text boxes, if they are left empty, uh, we have no way of knowing if the SLAs are deliberately omitting information, accidentally including what they're supposed to be typing in there, or maybe the Wicked Witch dropped a house on you. We don't, we have no idea. Uh, uh, but you might, and, and we understand that sometimes these boxes may not be directly applicable to the project at hand. Um, however, you might be able to glean some content to fill in there uh, from your subrecipient applications, or if it is a statewide project, uh, and it's a solid program, we totally understand, but we can't read minds. We don't know what type of outcomes are coming from these projects. We are not Professor, Mar Professor Marvel, um, to give another Oz shout out. Uh, so please put some, some information in these text boxes. It's super helpful for us. Now, Terry already mentioned the state profile page refresh, uh, and many of you collaborated with us to help update these pages. As each state has its own profile on the IMLS website, uh, we updated them to reflect the new five-year plan information, the evaluation information, uh, and new projects. Uh, we've also included updated chief officer headshots and quotes. So feel free to go check them out. We're really proud of them and we're, we're really appreciated of your work of helping us uh, refresh those. And there is a screenshot here of what that looks like. Thank you, Mississippi, for, for being our visual uh, cue here. We have a nice quote from the chief um, as well as the project examples with some really great photographs. Uh, that was really quick, but overall, we want to, to let you guys know that what you submit in these in the SPR and how you relay your projects to us matters, and we already know you're doing great work, and we just want to make sure that that is conveyed. The value of those projects is conveyed to not just to your program officers, but to the United States at large. But I know there are questions. Hey, Dia, do you have a question? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. is about the attachment. Yes. So my um my folks love sharing using that attachment section and they almost always attach like the 200 list of folks that participated in their programs mm -hmm. as an attachment because mm -hmm. it's it's just too much it's capacity we can't add each one. Is that helpful or yeah. We've talked about that yes and it is helpful if if you if it's too laborious to include uh, the locale data in each activity 
uh, you can, but you have that list, it exists. You can upload that as an attachment uh, um, in the additional materials section of the project. Uh, we will see it, we will make note of it. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Yes, good job. Madison, I have two questions over here. Great. Okay, great. Um, the second question, I'm gonna stick with the attachments. Um, some of, this is coming from Rachel Cook in Utah. Some of our additional materials are really impressive or provide helpful context. Will there ever be an option to have them show up public facing? I love that question. And our next session is about the future of the SPR. So we're gonna, we're gonna parking lot that for the next session. Great. Thank, Thank you, you, Rachel. And our first question, let me scroll back up, is from Karen Egan. Um, she has a question on the locales. When possible, do you want this down to the building level? This is such a Karen Egan question. I love the detail, the attention to detail, Karen Egan. For example, the grant is awarded to Chicago Public Library, which has 81 branches. Um, but the project was only held at a particular branch. So this location lists that branch and the, and the address question. Oh, we're getting Terry. <laughs> <laughs> the SPR uh, preloaded um, PLS data at the system level. So that would be the Chicago Public Library level. So that is sort of our baseline understanding of what you're uploading. If you want to upload your individual branches, we're not going to stop you, but it is not required. Thank you, Karen. I don't know how we're doing on time. All right, no other questions. Uh, thank you all so much. Muchas gracias. All right. I'd like to call my two colleagues up to the dais, please, Sridhar and Matt, as we get started. Um, Madison gave us a wonderful kind of flyby SPR peek under the hood. And we're thinking of this next session as a little bit more of a deep dive into things that we could take from you and consider as we think about making iterative improvements to the SPR. So um, we have two colleagues from IMLS joining us for this next session. Um, many of you know Matt Birnbaum here in the middle. He is now the Director of, Evalu of uh, Research and Evaluation at IMLS, and he's been working with you longer than I have, uh, specifically Karen Reich and Debbie in Arkansas and Jamie in Arizona, worked with Matt over 10 years ago to start brainstorming about the future of the SPR um, and help architecting the system that we use today, which is no small feat. In addition to helping establish that evaluative framework, which is amazing, and all the other things that Matt does, I think the most amazing thing about Matt is that he's super approachable and wonderful. He's a wonderful fed, like you couldn't get a better fed than Matt Birnbaum. Um, so he's really interested in listening and learning from all of you. And he's gonna do the majority of our presenting here today. But first I wanna introduce um, a second IMLS colleague who is brand new to this community, but not to the SPR because he's been helping us for years. So Sridhar Khazaraju has been um, our acting CIO at times. And at the moment he is our senior IT program manager at IMLS. He helped us when we moved the SPR to cloud migration behind the scenes. That was a critical moment for the program, whether you knew it or not. And he's also been working on the visualization data that now goes from the SPR into the IMLS.gov website. He's constantly asking us really good questions about the SPR. And we said, why don't you just come with us to Seattle so you can hear from all of the people who are actually using it. And he did. So we're so thrilled he's here and you're going to be hearing from him as well. But I would like to start this off by turning it over to Matt. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to be here. 13 years ago when I first joined IMLS, 
it was if some of you got to be with me in Baltimore, my first meeting, and we started a strategic planning exercise. And the question we wanted to say to ourselves, how, how does a reading program in Michigan compare to one in Mississippi using federal funds? What does that look like? And as we looked what the reporting was like back then, we didn't have the tools to do that. So consequently, we were handicapping ourselves in trying to tell a story about the difference that reading programs make, the ways that they function and vary, the things that are similar, and the importance of that little bit of federal dollars to helping make that contribution. So we then spent bit of time working through, got some, some smart people like Sridhar to uh, help us with the architect. And a lot of you worked with some, some folks who had my skills and it was a real team collaboration using the expertise of the folks like you in library science, the expertise of the information engineers and some of the cloudy, vague uh, social science folks like myself to uh, work together and to build out the system. Um, and it's always been based on trying to accommodate different needs, trying to make sure that the federal policymakers who have to be accountable to taxpayer dollars can have some good assurances that the dollars are being spent really well. It's also being to ensure that all of you can be benchmarking yourselves over time, as well as each other, to start thinking about what's going on, what can I learn from? And so we're at this point now where a decade later, we don't quite want to do all that crazy lifting we did a decade ago, but let's look at the system in terms of what really works well, what might be able to work a little bit better. And in doing so, we're really introducing you to Sridhar because he's going to be the, the main architect. But Terry and I, Terry says really sweet things about me, but Terry is like my favorite colleague because I know that she is so considerate and so respectful and she is such an active listener. And when she says, Matt, I think this is a good opportunity for us to work together, I'm gonna to be really excited and we're really happy to be here. So this is kind of the overview. We'll do, Terry and I will present a little bit in the beginning, and then we're gonna have some questions for you. And we're gonna really be starting a conversation where we're gonna be listening, no action, but we'll be coming back later in the fall with some reflections. Okay, so a little bit, big picture. So a decade ago, we were post Baltimore, we were probably in Nashville, can't remember where, St. Louis, Kansas City, Milwaukee. And we're building out the system and we've got 15 states who are the ones who are piloting it, Michigan, Illinois, Arkansas, all these great folks that I know some of them are here today, uh, Arizona. And then we were looking at what Public Library Association, Emily, before she was working with IMLS, she was my counterpart at PLA and she was heading the project outcome. And we started to align our outcome reporting with project outcomes that the public libraries didn't have to do two separate things. It was something identical. And then as Terry was mentioning, we, behind the scenes, we had brilliance of Sridhar and we started moving this to a cloud migration. And now we've been in the steady state. And we've got some really great national data, but what can we do to do a little bit better to make your lives a little bit easier in terms of your compliance work is also to be able to do some better improvement in learning. So a little bit of an example. Um, here's you know, the way we built the system out. We used to tell the stories. And when we were, what the heck does this, this grant data do? Oh, well, if we give the state some money for them to use in their territories, they're gonna be doing something like maybe building up their infrastructure, the capacity. Maybe it's about doing lifelong learning. Maybe it's about human services civic engagement, economic development. And we started breaking those out into 13 separate intents. And that's just the way every project is based on this uniform common thing that however it might differ in Iowa compared to 
uh, New Mexico compared to Maine, it was all based on what the intentionality was in terms of making some uh, person in one of these public libraries across the country lives a little bit better. And then we started thinking about, well, not only what's the outcome, what's the intent, but how can we better describe it? So the first part was where. Some of these places, it might be one small community, another might be statewide. So we all started looking at ways practically to start describing where those locales where the activity was going, and then looking at the beneficiaries. Was it some part of the library workforce? Or was it a part of the public? And if it was a public, was it the broad general public? Or was it really targeted to some specific population? And if so, we can get pretty precise. So these were some examples of what the system was. And then administratively, trying to make it a little bit better and easier for all of us, all of you, to use the data to improve your administrative decisions, any planning, any policy conversations. So we started doing these data pulls. It's a kind of wicked wild data set. So we made it a little bit easier to pull out the Excel spreadsheets to give to your evaluators or possibly yourselves. There's some work with the automatic default to draft status to make it easier for when you're doing your reporting every year and then saving the active scenes, active screens. And now we're starting to look at maybe over the next three or so years, can we do some much more incremental but important enhancements that would make it a little bit better for yourselves, for policymakers who are looking for the data, for the libraries themselves, and for the citizens who are using those services. Okay, principles, just the same way it's always been. This is truly a partnership, Terry and her team and all of you, I always love coming here because there's such great mutual respect and admiration and consideration for what everybody does. And it'll be that same way going forward. It's gotta work for IMLS, it's gotta work for the states and territories. So to do that, we're gonna rely on your active participation and input. It's not gonna be, even if street art is really bright, your folks and your knowledge collectively is much brighter and it's gonna be what's gonna be driving the system. Some of the improvements will particularly help all of you and some might help IMLS itself, but we'll be transparent about all of that. And we're gonna to try to do it in a way which is gonna be respectful of the actual real world demands you have. We know that we're in the beginning of a five-year planning cycle and the first three years is what's used for the evaluation. So we're not going to do any big heavy lifts during those three years of reporting. We'll try to time that right. Okay, so some potential facets of work and everything's on the table. But when Terry's team and my team began talking about this a couple months ago, here were just some of the big buckets. And we brought Sridhar in. Can we update the look and feel of when you actually log on to the SBR? What are some ways we can make that user interface just a little bit better? Is there behind the scenes, what you folks may not know is Terry and her team spent a ridiculous amount of time doing manual labor to get the SBR to integrate to the larger grant reporting system that IMLS has to report in called the EGMS. So we're gonna be looking at some ways maybe to streamline that, make it automatic so that the staff themselves don't have to spend so much of their manual time doing this work. Trying to find some better ways of the data that we're collecting it, making it more useful for all of you to use in your decisions. Maybe it's some improvements with data visualizations, trend analysis, maybe it might be some better work using some narrative keyword searches, lots of ways. And today's focus though is really understanding what the experience is like for each of you. Everything, every design step going forward is gonna be based on your experience as a user. So Terry, I think I'm gonna turn it over to you. And let's kind of like work it through through what the user sees. We realize that not all of you might have shown up today with the SPR in your mind. So we're gonna give you a visual flyby to just refresh us all on what we're talking about. Here's the login screen. 
you go in, if you're an LSTA coordinator, you're probably adding a project. You could be copying or continuing a project from a prior year. There are some options here. Once you get to the add a project page, there's some initial fields you're filling out. You're giving it a title, an abstract, telling us who the director and the grantee are. We've got those additional materials that Hadia was talking about and lots of budget information. This is one of those fields that Madison mentioned, actually both of these fields, not in the public view. This is the controlled vocabulary kind of section of the SPR where we're asking you to pick one of the 14 intents that roll up to those six focal areas that Matt was talking about earlier. Plus, we ask you to add up to two subjects, which are subsets of um, different library areas that you could be working on. So this vocabulary is set in the system. We go into, you know, every project has a big umbrella and then there's little activities below it. And so we ask you to fill out activity titles and abstracts as well. The activity specifically has what we call modes and formats and quantities. Oh my. And <laughs> we know that this has been a traditional pain point for some of you in interpreting, you know, what, what are we really looking for here as IMLS? We ask you to get down to the activity beneficiaries if it's not the general public or the library workforce. You know, are you looking to target certain populations with certain projects? Madison talked through the activity locale options. I just lay it out again as something that we've traditionally give you some choices around, but these choices have influence on what shows up on our website then. And so we're here to kind of talk about, you know, trade-offs in that information. The project outcomes area is open text. So if there are things, really good, important impacts that you haven't already talked about, we want to hear them in this section. We also have a way for you to tag a project as exemplary, which really helps us when we're asked to call like some highlights of the program for the year. And you can use open-ended language to give us additional project tags that might be helpful for you to track. And it's also sometimes helpful for us to track. And then you get to the project status area where you're completing the project, saving the project, saving and continuing and saving and saving because we know that's a pain point in the SPR as well. And then you eventually generate a project list and all your money magically rolls up into these projects. And then you go to validate and ah, there's these error messages. So you're not alone. Everybody gets these. And then you save and ta-da, you're done. So <laughs> fly by. I'm going to hand it back to Matt as we uh, talk about what's next. Okay, first principle, we're just starting the conversation today. We've got 10 questions. We'll take the rest of this session to try to get some feedback about those. Try to make sure everyone has a chance to participate if you want, but there'll be more time. This is gonna be, we're gonna be trying to collect this information over the summer so that by the fall, we might be able to have a more informed deliberation about next steps. So these are the questions and we're gonna break them out into a little bit. So walk us through your use of the SBR through the year, what's working well and meeting your needs, and what are the pain points? I'm gonna shut up for about 30 seconds. Then we'll take a couple of hand, couple hands. You all have some post-it notes on your table. You can just take those and just start scribbling. Terry, Sridhar and I, we're gonna collect those at the end. So anything that we don't get in addition to the conversation, we've got it. And it'll help us as we start collecting data and analyzing it going forward. Okay, so I'm gonna shut up maybe just 30 seconds, then we'll take some hands on this first question.
So, you know, as the elder, my memory gets bad and my eyesight's really bad. So I'm just going to be calling on people and I probably know you and I'm, I forget. I just ask for apologies from, but can somebody please, someone want to raise their hand and get us, get the conversation going. Go ahead, Jamie. I get to say this. Thank you for the data export. Yes. So that's something yeah. that works well. Um, the thing that right now I'm having a pain point about is a safe way for subrecipients to enter uh, data directly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I worry because it's based on library system and they yep. don't have individual accounts. Yep. So I'm just going to repeat that the issue of trying to have subrecipients report directly. How do you manage that? It's kind of a challenge. Somebody else. Hey, I just, I guess my, one of my big requests is I look at the SPR and I work with the SPR all the time, pretty much all year round. However, like the state librarian, not so much. Yeah. He only looks at it once a year maybe there could be better prompts for how to certify stuff in the SPR. That, that was my pain point. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, your name again is? Mary Ramey, Maryland yeah. State Library Thank Agency. you. Thank you. Somebody else, please. Thanks. I have lots of ideas. Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> As someone new working with the program, I found the reports really helpful to look at to see what our agency has been doing over the last couple of years. Um, I know I've had other new employees also reading through the past reports, and yeah. it's a place where that data is summarized, and we don't really have any other locations where that information is all together in one place. So really, really helpful for our own staff to use. Thank you. Your name again is? Talayla from Idaho. Thanks, Talayla. Okay, lots of ideas, person. Okay, how do you ask? Oh, you want me anywhere? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just one, all right? Are we talking about what you like? I'll give you two. Do, okay. You get things you like or things that are challenges, either way. Okay. I like the fact that I have control because um, control is a good thing with the SPR and getting data. Uh, what I would like, I think initially with working with new people entering in data to the SPR, that the help techs be more human focused. Right. Thank you. And because I'm generous, I'll take one more comment before I move to the next one. Matt, we have a couple virtual. Please. Okay, great. Um, in the activities for content and acquisition, it would be great to add counts for supplies and materials purchased. Um, this is Rachel Cook from Utah. Great, thank you. Who's a smart advance. Um, I have had libraries pay for life or pay for lots of things recently. Um, we pay for um, lots of children's programming in the pandemic, and those supplies can be reported in counts. Um, if I should be reporting it differently, just let me know. Um, and then I have a couple, so just bear with me. Um, one request from Jeanette in Vermont is to, it would be helpful, she says, if the numbers we enter into the open text box within the budget section, um, basically auto-populate. Um, and then Shannon Furlow, um, a pain point for us is how to translate outputs into something that we can show more widely. One of my staff said that we report on, on such a way that doesn't really feel it accurately reflects on what we do. How can we change that narrative? Hey, thanks so much, Cindy. These are all great. Next question. What does pre-SPR info gathering look like? And does it involve other systems? What's working well or not? It's gonna give you 30 seconds. Take those post-its and we'll start the conversation all the way, we'll, and we'll start all the way back at that end table when we're ready.
And please do post stuff on those posted things. We'll collect it. This is a great question. I was trying to ponder just how far behind I was on the SPR recently, and I was trying to chunk up time. And I think the pre-planning is about 20%. Um, I have um, essentially an Excel planning budget because I force everyone to send all of their charges through me, subgrants or, yeah. or statewide projects. And then per project, it's all tabbed out and I have every charge. So then I make a chart that is project overview activities, project overview activities. And I fit all the charges in until I'm done with all of the money. And then I turn around and tell the other staff, all right, this is where your expenditures were. So this is the report you have to turn in. And I turn them back to a Google form that matches the SPR. Interesting. So, yeah, my Excel sheet, many spreadsheets, Google Forms, yeah. then, <laughs> then to the SBR. Thanks, Karen. I think you just gave Sridhar lots of food for fodder. Please, your name? Hi, I'm Nicolette from Rhode Island. Hi, Rhode um, So we do a lot of outlining and drafting in Word, just basically. And I'm wondering, I have gone through and kind of created a template for all our projects based on what's in the SPR, but is that something you might be able to provide so that we can work on it outside of the system in a way that's a little more user-friendly to the average um, person so that they can still answer all the questions, including all of those like little questions that sometimes we forget are gonna be there. Um, so I'll have my staff fill, do a whole report and then I'll go and I'll be like, oh, I have five questions that got triggered that I wasn't necessarily expecting. So perhaps a template for that might be useful. Thank you. Thanks. Matt, I've got a couple virtuals. Um, again, from Shannon Furlow. My departments gather statistics in such different ways that I have to translate at SPR time. It would be nice if we could change um, to use SPR questions year round. Um, and then in Florida, we try to synchronize our state's annual reporting with the SPRs. Um, having a clean, this is someone else, Alexandra from South Carolina, having a clean template to provide to others would be really helpful. Everybody loves a good template, Matt. Message is coming in clearly. Hey, Sarita, before we go to the next question, just a quick, any quick brief, some th things that you're thinking about as you listen to the conversation developing. Yeah, sure. Uh, a couple of things I realized was uh, with the source data, right? Uh, one of the individuals talked about the, the templates to help them out. Uh, that, that's the key thing. When we were talking about the source systems and how we integrate source systems with the SPR and SPR to the downstream like EGMS, that's the automation where like, you know, where 20% of the time somebody said like, you know, the pre-planning would take 20 to 30% of the time. How can we reduce that? If there is a way to do that, we would love to really work with you guys and make that a kind of a standard template and that, that will improve the efficiency. So that, that's one of the key things that definitely we would love to work with you all. Thanks, Radar. Move to the next question. Question four, what works doesn't work well in terms of reporting project level budgets. Could we get it more fine tuned for not the project, but an activity? As a reminder, every project has at least one activity. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the messenger. <laughs> but as you think, we'll give you like 30, 15, 30 seconds, and we'll start the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so please please an old friend <laughs>
Um, when we first started doing the SPR, when you first came on board and Arkansas was a pilot project, that was the goal was activity level. And as we started working on it, I think we found that that was not attainable. And so we kind of drew back from that. And I think that's still the case. The activity level at our state, you know, the way we do our finances and budgeting at the state level, that would require a large burden on us and coding and accounting principles and stuff like that. So I would say activity level may not be the best way to go. Thanks, Debbie. Good to see you. <laughs> so Carmen, North Dakota, um, new, a new fiscal director, and I'm relatively new in LSTA as well. So we're working together and our fiscal director really wants the budget to be set up aligning with a five-year plan mm -hmm. so that all of our money then is put into projects. So what I see is 29 projects for the upcoming years. And so it'll all be coded according, every expense will be coded according to those projects. And that is how she would like it. And I think that's kind of what you are asking for, but it's probably not quite at the activity level. Right. But at the project level. Yeah. Thank you. Matt, the virtual folks are saying thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> Imagine that. Um, I just wanted to jump on. Um, so much of our LSTA funds support staff time because um, we are a very small state and we do have a very activity level, sort of very complicated uh, reporting structure that we do for our time. But even with that, with, and again, we're very small, it's very difficult to get staff to consistently and correctly report their time in a way that genuinely accurately reflects things at an activity level, I think we managed to kind of capture it all at a project level. So I, I love project level. I'm pro keeping it. Thank you. Uh, Carmen, North Dakota, once again. Um, I did not remember that, yes, this is going to require our staff to basically do time cards and um, that we do find that to be a potential um, problem. Um, however, we have not given up on that totally. Thank you. Yep. Just another scenario for our um, federal projects, each project has its own code and that code is set up in June of each previous year and we start our new projects in October with our federal funds. Um, our coding is set up in June. If at some point there is a new activity that comes about starting in October, there would be no coding for it and no way to um, track it by the activity level because we've already set up the coding Thanks. the previous June. Debbie, so, what's your state's fiscal year? Does it begin July? Is it July to June? Yeah, July, June. Thanks. Move to the next one. What works and doesn't work in terms of controlled vocabulary like we use for subjects? I think we have 32 subject codes and then we give you, you can you select up to two subjects and then you can enter your own additional keywords, your own tags. And we give you a chance to add up to three tags. So when you think about the controlled vocabulary for subjects, tags, what works and what doesn't work? What can be improved? So these tags are a thing. All right. So I've been like every other state building templates and things like that. Pennsylvania, by the way. Hadia, hey, how you doing? And with the tags, I feel like we have been submitting enough reports in the SPR. Is there a way to pull those tags yes. to then 
compile like sort of like a starting sure. list yes. so that we can hit a drop down box or a check box instead of typing in these tags every single time. Because open text fields, when you're trying to like analyze that data is a nightmare. And so that would be helpful. And also with data entering in, that would help my um, advisors with those little things in life, you know. So what, one, one lesson I learned in uh, advancing in IMLS is to hire really smart people, people smarter than me, like Emily. And then we, we used to have a statistician, Lisa, that came here. And those of you who remember Lisa, Lisa used to take these keyword tags and really start helping doing us analysis. We wanted to see what was the investment, return on investment for early literacy or digital literacy. We were using those tags. So that's something we can definitely follow up with you on. Thanks. Matt, we have a request with um, what I'm gonna go with as a, an update of the tags themselves some things that may be more intuitive, like Wi-Fi, something more direct and um, instinctive as far as what's being used or utilized by um, end users or libraries. Right. Okay. Oh, let's go backwards then. Sorry, it's for no, please. On, uh, um, Wi-Fi on um, tags. Wendy, you are from what state? South Carolina. Okay, I think it would be great if you did have drop downs, but still have the option of open fields. Okay. Because when something new happens, you want to be able to still report it. Thanks, Wendy. What works doesn't work well in terms of reporting project level. Oh, we did this. I'm not going back there. <laughs> <laughs> what works doesn't work well in terms of current locale flexibility, reporting by institution details or just a number. Sometimes IMLS, IMLS can't convey the true reach of the program without geolocation data. Some background. This is going to be the elder speaking up. So 10 to 13 years ago, when we were first trying to build this system, we knew that some projects were the SLA was doing for its entire territory, like entire state. Sometimes it was being subgranted to a recipient who was covering maybe just one community. And then we had these weird things in between, or maybe it was all the big cities or all the small rural towns, or maybe just part of a state. And we didn't have a way to capture that. So we created a proxy of locale like the number of school libraries, for instance. And this is kind of the way we've been going. So as you look at this question here, we've got some maps to try to show you where we're at right now. For some of the states, um, when we create a hypothetical of West Dakota, let's assume that West Dakota, only they don't do any sub-recipients. And so everything that shows up is for wherever that's capital for the SLA is located. And if we try to try to visualize and share it with congressional people or whoever, it's gonna be looking like all that state's data is just concentrated right where the state capital is. Now, if you picture that to the left, here's an opportunity where some state is giving us voluntarily a little bit more detail about those locales where it's captured so we can get a better sense of the reach of the investment in that state but it's a work in progress. So as you think about this, what works and doesn't work in your ability to tell stories about where the SLA dollars are going in your territory? Think about my extra work, go for it. <laughs> so it's all with that humanistic approach, right? Yeah. So I feel like if there was an easier way to upload the locale data, that you would get more locale data. Right now, it's that the manual data entry, and it you know it's all of us are wearing like twenty million hats. Y'all know how it is, and so that's why that if there was an easier way for data entry, yeah, like uploading. Thank you. How about um, a congressional district field? Oh, I think you just made made a lot of fans with that comment, Jamie.
I know I'm getting between you and lunch, but I'm still gonna push a little bit more. North Dakota, come on up. No, everybody's just trying to speak at the level at which I put the mic. So I wanna raise it because I'm uncomfortable for them. Seventh question. What SBR data is most useful to you year round and during the five year evaluation? Great question. So, you know, think about the five year evaluation. What were some of the data elements that were really helpful or doing annual, annual reporting? Take about 15, 30 seconds, then we'll start the conversation. And I'm at the point now where I'm going to voluntarily call on people who I know are, are quiet who will, they see me later, they're gonna pull my arm with their suggestions. <laughs> yeah. What's it like in Missouri? <laughs> Come on up. Well, we do use the SPR for some things. A lot of times we collect uh, as far as like new projects and that sort of thing from conferences such as this or PLAA or listening to other things. Yeah. Um, and then we go back to the SPR to get the data to move forward. Do you use PLS too? Do you ever blend them? Anyone with aspirations? types of data stories you wish we could be telling. Matt, Shannon Furlow, um, year round were the surveys, which I need my staff to do more. Uh, five year, it was outputs to see overall impact. Thank you. It's a tough crowd today. Maybe I'll, can I give a, I'll do a proxy for Colorado since they're the image on this slide. It's one of the few states we saw that actually used the outcome survey data in service to their five-year evaluation. So shout out to Jean, who's online virtually. And also just a question, like, can you see yourselves using this data in the same way? Or is, is the survey outcome data on a different level for you? And what could we do to potentially make it useful? Pennsylvania, come on up. Pennsylvania! No. <laughs> no, you know what? It's really hard because, you know, we are definitely evaluation and income, um, not income, but data driven. Yeah. But with entering in the data, we find ourselves buttoned up against, um, uh, give me the word, um, <laughs> When you, when you round, like when you round up or you round down. Oh, estimation. Yeah, estimations. And so when we actually get to the data that we're putting in, our data is skewed because a lot of it leads towards estimating. Yep. So then when my advisors are trying to plan programs, it's not really creating the picture that they want. Got it. So my advisors build their own data collection stuff with their programs that we end up just uploading in the attachments because the SPR doesn't really ask the questions to capture what it is we find as useful. So however, that could be kind of melded or somewhat. It's hard dealing with all these things. I think it's, good. I think it's safe for me to say, I'm speaking for Street or Ontario, I think it's safe. We would love to have any of those stories, any of those tools that you're using in your state. That would help us a lot. Srinor, do you have anything? Any no, that, you that goes back to my initial readers where uh, whatever the, uh, the tools that you're using to collect the data or to upload it to the SPR. If there is some mechanism on your side, we would love to make that simpler by automating the process. I mean, think of it as like, you know, the Excel spreadsheet that you maintain and automatically it be ingested into SPR and it automatically ingested into EGMS. And that's how all the three systems are integrated. I mean, th th that's the vision that we, I know there'll be lots of things that we have to, uh, the hurdles I would say, <laughs> but but I, I think we can do the work around and we can make this uh, a lot better. I mean, do you lots of your stuff, like absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we need to talk for sure. <laughs> Please. Catherine from North Carolina. Uh, 
the outcome data for us, I think, is so at the activity level for a lot of our sub awards. So you might have three activities and only one of them has a required survey. So just kind of reporting on, on that outcome um, level data just for one part of a project yep. isn't as um, beneficial for us at the project level. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Thank you for sharing that. Hector. Estoy practicando el idioma otra vez, mi amigo. Ok, um, en Puerto Rico estamos pensando trabajar la, el, un formulario um, en Microsoft Power Apps. Pa, uh, no. In Puerto Rico, we are considering creating a form using Microsoft Power Apps. Eh, tenemos una situación porque los informes no los, no los hacen llegar los bibliotecarios en general en español. And we have a situation because the librarians furnish their reports in Spanish to us. Entonces, la persona que antes pasaba el SPR se tardaba tres o cuatro días entre entrar los proyectos, eh, traducir y luego entonces entrar la parte financiera. Y de verdad es, es bien complicado. So the, the person in charge of uploading to the SPR took like three days or more because they had to translate the forms, enter them into the SPR, and then after that, go into the financial area. So it gets really cumbersome. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Matt, um, Shannon from Georgia. I love the batch upload feature. I wish I could do it for activities. Thank you. Next question. Thinking about everything, including 10 minutes to lunch. What are your time investments? Where are your time investments disproportionate to the payoff? So what are the things that you're putting in a lot of time to enter the data and it's just not giving you good bang for the buck? Any particular pain points? Jeff? I'm, I'm still relatively new at this, but I think for me, one of the things that I've encountered um, giving out the, the grants and the projects is I'm only ever gonna be as good as the projects and the reports that I'm getting back from people. So that's why the idea that a, a template that I can give people and say, here's what I need, here's what it needs yeah. to look like at the end, that I can sort of seamlessly yep. get into the SPR. So I'm not acting as a translator yep. um, for these things. And they know what's expected. They know what ultimately I'm gonna be needing. So um, like I said, the, just the realization that I'm only gonna be as good as, as what I'm getting from yep. the, the project leads. Thank you, it's great. Mm -hmm. Come on. Okay. So, all right, this is just more of a, well, uh, section page level validations. It isn't really about that, but usually when I'm getting to the end and I'm adding, adding things in, when I hit those errors, it'd be great if we had page level validation, if that was at all possible to help. Um, I have just, I think this might be more of an us problem in my state than a you problem, but because we're spending so much time getting this data ready, I always feel like I'm never, I should be doing it now, planning for next year and ensuring that like everything we have is aligned to what's in there instead of what our individual departments are creating. And I just feel like I can never quite get ahead of that so that the next report is really, really meaningful to us in a way where we're not transforming some of the data that our individual people are collecting and then turning it into this. And again, I think it's an us problem that I'm trying to work on, but it does seem like I can never quite get there. Thank you. No problem. I don't think you're unique either. I have something that feels it may be an us problem as well, but for me, the actual difficulties with the SPR, I 
completely agree with the you're only as good as your sub um, grantees reports. That is true. And yet I'd almost rather work with them than trying to get the data that I need from our financial department. I don't know how many other states have a real disconnect from the finance people versus them. Um, but I had a conversation with our CFO this year in which, or past grant year, where I kept going back and saying, okay, well, you told me you sent, spent it on miscellany. I can't report miscellany. What is that? And she finally said, well, why, why do you need to know that? And she had no idea that we had a budget narrative to go with that because she'd never looked at it. Um, I think she thought I was just being super annoying and trying to like make myself more important than I was. And I had to say, IMLS actually wants more than just the numbers from you. Um, so if there was any way to have like a, a list, something we could provide to our business office, here are the things that you need to be tracking so that it's not just Angela really wants you to be accountable to her, even though, <laughs> you know, even though you're the CFO and she's just doing this more, Angela is going to have to go and justify this to her program officer. And she would really love it if you said we something more than we bought stuff. So. Angela, another one to make many people happy here today. You got a couple. Matt, Tamara from um, Oregon. One concept we wrestle with is deep and narrow impact versus wide and shallow. Yep. Numbers seem to speak to statewide impact. Sometimes an activity is only for 15 libraries, but the impact is deep. It seems like we need more in terms of context to really tell the story. That's great. Yeah, the, 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 the investments reach so many people. Absolutely. Um, I think we're moving to the last question. Beyond updating the SBRs, beyond the engineering of the system, is there anything else we can do to help streamline or reduce the administrative burden you have and those of your subrecipients? So putting aside the SPR, anything else we could do? Okay. <laughs> One thing we could probably do, because we have, I think all of us have our own little tools in our own little pockets that could probably help somebody else. You ask on um, one of the things on the SBR during the outcomes is best practices or whatever, but I haven't, we, ha I don't think we've had a chance to a place where we can deposit any of our tools and make it help someone else. Cool. So like the question about finances and activities, we don't even worry, we don't even ask finance to ask to do our um Activity level activities, we have our subrecipients give us that and we actually comb through their receipts yep, and yep. our requests for funds. Yep. But we do have different um, procedures that we've outlined that may help someone else um, that may or may not be in our manual. But anyway. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. So I'm gonna turn it, I'm gonna just do a quick update and turn it to Terry. So one of the things that's coming down the horizon is Srira has been working with the programmer and one of the, my team members who's a data scientist, we've been working with a piece of software called Tableau to try to improve the ability to take the data that's collected in SPR and to create into some types of apps that you can all use for trying to tell some stories. So we wanted to let you know that that's coming down the pipe. But um, Terry, I think I want to turn it to you and wrapping us up for turn just read wrapping us up. Sweet. 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 you want to go there or you want to start from here? Either way. I'm fine. So, this is the uh, MFA. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much for that great feedback. I mean, this is my first time here and super excited and thanks for the great introduction you both. Um, so just to introduce myself again, I'm Sridhar Kesi Raju, Senior IT Program Manager, OCIO IMLS. So as we were talking about the features and the functions of the SPR, I just want to pivot a little bit to the cybersecurity aspect of it. 
uh, uh, trust me, I mean, I won't uh, do more technical jargon here, but I'll try to be as simple as possible. So uh, as you know, it's been, the cyber threats have been increasing so much. Uh, lately, the federal government have issued like, you know, more than 40 directives in the last 12 months for us to beef up the whole security. We've been doing a lot of these security initiatives at the background. You may not see them, but as one of the examples being the cloud, when we moved to the cloud, we moved to Gov Cloud. So there are lots of security controls we do. So recently, a White House passed this, um, uh, issued a directive, it's called White House National Cyber Security Initiative. Uh, but there are like lots of things that we have to do, which we have been doing. But one of the things that matters here, the relevant to this context is the multi-factor authentication. I'm sorry, another acronym. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, it's MFA, we call it. Uh, again, uh, this MFA is something that's being mandated at this point of time for any other public systems which requires authentication. SPR being in the application where you need to log in. So we have to make that a multi-factor authentication. So for many of you may already know what the multi-factor authentication is, right? I mean, even the daily life, you have the banking applications where you log in and there will be a code sent to your email or text. So it's pretty much that. Uh, and also if you're using other government applications like EGMS, IMLS EGMS or other applications, they do use the solutions like login.gov. So they provide both uh, single sign-on as well as the multi-factor authentication. So having said that, so our goal as part of the future of SPR is to implement multi-factor authentication. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, other securities, as I said, you may not have direct impact on you or the users of the system, but MFA definitely you will see that impact because it's just, it, it differs the way you log into the system. But again, our goal is to minimize the impact uh, uh, negatively. Um, so uh, Terry, I'm working with Terry and Matt on like, you know, what are the solutions available? So we would love to go with the solution that we are all familiar with, like login.gov. But again, there are certain logistics that we have to uh, consider. There are lots of other factors. So as soon as we make some decisions, um, we will keep you posted on that. Uh, and we will give enough time for you guys to test it out, make sure everything is smooth before we uh, we're up there. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna take everything we heard. And actually, if you have sticky notes, um, I am gonna leave right after this to go to the Talking Book Library. So maybe put your sticky notes, if you would, at the Cindy Laura table. We can just make like a big brick of sticky notes that we take back with us to IMLS. Um, we're so interested in continuing this conversation and mulling over what we heard today and continuing to get your input. Um, thank you to my colleagues. We're not actually going to have time for questions, but we have the parking lot, so that's what that's for. Um, one quick note before lunch break, and I see many presents on the back. If you want to be part of that state networking activity and have a gift, make sure it's there by the end of lunch at the table in the back of the room. If you want to walk with me to the Talking Book and Braille Library, I'm going to make a beeline out to the registration table, countdown clock of like 30 seconds, and then I'm going to take off. But you can also get there on your own. It's about a 20-minute walk, and it's kind of just straight down. You can get to 8th Avenue from here. It's, it's basically a straight shot. So we'll be back at 1.15 Pacific time. Lunch is on your own. There are ideas in your packet if you haven't seen them already. And we'll hear about ARPA highlights at lunch, so you, after lunch. So you want to be sure you'll be back in time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>